So we're in. Uh, we're at our final session of the conference, the Ask Father session. We've got a whole host of questions. We'll try to get through as many as uh, of them as we can. So the first question uh, is directed at Father Isaac. And Father, you said uh, that if one makes a perfect act of love, it will take away all of one's temporal punishments. Can you explain that more? Is that taught by a saint uh, or by a, by a father or by the Council of Trent? Where can we find that in church teaching? Well can't take right now I'd have to do a little looking it up exactly but it's it's typical it's a teaching of the church consistently a perfect act of love wipes away all mortal sin all venial sins and even it does takes away temporal punishment uh, I, I love the way Bishop Fulton Sheen ex explains uh, like the temporal punishment part because once you're forgiven your sins, you still have to make reparation now for that sin. So he used an example like a piece of wood. There was a plain piece of wood, uh, perfect. And take a nail and you hammer it into the wood. The nail represents sin. So the priest absolves you. The sin is gone. You take the nail. But what's left, there's a hole in that wood. And it has to be puttied up. And, and that's where we have to make reparation. So when we die, if you're in a state of grace... You, if you have any, if you don't atone for all your sins and make reparation, that's what purgatory is for. And I always encourage people to strive for heaven. Don't be striving just for purgatory because if you miss that, it's all downhill, you know. <laughs> and as far, but it is a consistent teaching of the church with a perfect Saint Alphonse Liguori. It's in his moral books, and all the great moralists talk about this perfect act of love. I explained it today. Basically, uh, John Vianney with the man who committed su tried to commit suicide, jumping off the bridge. He did die, but between the bridge and the water, he was given that. Now it's an extraordinary grace, and too many don't think that. Say, oh, well, I'm just going to go my merry way, commit sin, and right before I die, I'm going to make this perfect act of love. Because the other point that I didn't make about a perfect act of love, you can't be attached to any sin, even venial sin. And so it's a pure love for God with no fear of hell. You, you don't want to offend him. So I hope that helps. Uh, the next question uh, is uh, actually two people put a very similar question, uh, and it's for you, Father, in, in respect of your uh, speech on priestly celibacy. And I'll just read one of them because it sums up both. The Bible says that St. Peter was married, so if Jesus chose him as the first pope, how can we say that celibacy is apostolic or started by Jesus' intention? Okay, a, a couple of things. The first point on that is that we do have a consistent uh, also apostolic tradition that all of the apostles, uh, some of whom may have been married, but that all of the apostles, once they began to follow Christ, so let's say once that formally they you know, were following him, that they left everything behind, including their wives. So the point is, is that it is uh, in our tradition that all of the apostles, once they became that, that they lived in perfect continence. So... Obviously, there you have then the um, apostolic origins for priestly celibacy. Just a, a small detail that uh, I was discussing with also. I, I wasn't quite exactly aware of this, but you know, I'm, I'm grateful to my brother because he was commenting this to me. Um, we have to be, I think, very precise when we say that the Bible says something because if you strictly go by sacred scripture, sacred scripture never says that St. Peter was married. What it does do is it makes reference to his mother-in-law, um, but doesn't say he's married because there is a very possible argument to be made that the, even at that time, that he had been widowed. Um, and it, it's interesting, and that partly also because of the whole question of 
how in, in, the, in the gospel passage that mentions the mother-in-law, that the mother-in-law is actually the one who, um, let's say, begins to serve the, the people there after she's healed, as opposed to you would think if the wife were there, the wife would, would have done that. But um, I think that's, let's say, just a smaller point on how one has to be precise in saying, in, in affirming that, let's say, sacred scripture says a certain thing. The main point, though, is that, that uh, after following our Lord, all of the apostles practiced uh, perfect continence, and that continued after that. So, again, the apostolic origins of priestly celibacy. There's an excellent book, if anybody's really interested to look more into that. There's an excellent book by the author's name is Cochini. He's a Jesuit priest. And so it's pretty exhaustive, the study that he does, uh, you know, showing all the evidence for the apostolic origins of priestly celibacy. He actually even goes through a list. He's got a really long list of different priests over the course of like the first, I don't know, five, six, seven centuries that uh, were married. But basically showing how, you know, once they entered the clerical state, they were practicing perfect continence. So I don't know if Father would like to add anything. Well, just a couple of points on that. Uh, I remember years ago I met a priest, Catholic priest, who was an Anglican priest first, and unfortunately I think, you know, they let him become a Catholic priest. I don't think I wouldn't approve of that stuff. But anyway, he was talking, and uh, many priests always say, well, well, you're a married man. What, don't you think the rest of us should be able to get married? And the first thing he says, no, no, it's no good. You know, to be, when you have a wife, you have children, you know, you have to take care of them, you know. And, and when you're going out anointing people two, three in the morning, come back and go back out. So, but I'm going to give you a little tip. When you meet people that are for priests getting married, uh, I've never lost the argument yet. And I, it's not on a theological basis that I make this. So I say to them, well, number one, I'm sure you're a very faithful Catholic, and you tithe, and you give 10% of your salary, right? So now you want married priests. Okay, so now you're going to boost it up to at least 20%, because he has to give a good example, and he can't use contraception, so he's going to have 8, 10, 12 kids. And who's going to pay for their education? Who's going to put a roof over their heads, because he can't live with the other priests? And they all say, you know what? I'm against that now. <laughs> <laughs> And one more thing about a celibacy, which people don't realize, like, say, in, in uh, countries like Russia and China, when the communists come, if you're, say, you're a married priest, you're an orthodox, that's why the orthodox gave in, too, and they come to you, and you're a priest, and they say, if you don't do what we tell you, in other words, apostatize, and do what we teach, what we want you to teach, we're going to do things to your wife, your daughters, in front of you, and after we finish doing those horrible things, we're going to shoot them, kill them, and you have to live with that the rest of your life. So they come up to a priest like Father Rodriguez or myself, we hopefully with God's grace say, do what you have to do. I can't wait to get out of this world, but so it's, uh, you know. Yeah, just a quick comment based on what Father Isaac just said. I think that any serious person also, if you really uh, give it some thought, that uh, from a practical point of view, kind of some of the examples that Father Isaac gave, I think that from a practical point of view, one will see also the great wisdom in, in the fact that uh, our Lord instituted the priesthood in that way and that, you know, the church discipline has always followed that in terms of priestly celibacy because I think you, you can um, anticipate all kinds of difficulties in terms of really being able to, the priest, dedicate himself 100% you know, to God and to the church where he married. And again, just examples that Father Isaac gave. So I think that's also part of it. But as, I mean, I didn't really go into that in my talk because uh, that certainly isn't the most important. I mean, the most important are the, you know, the theological reasons and also the, the fact that, that's, that it is, in fact, of apostolic tradition. And like I said in my talk, I think to, to always remember, and, and I think it's simple enough to, to remember that it's the example that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gave us. And the, the priest is another Christ. You know, I use the term in Latin, sacerdos alter Christus. So. And just 
one more thing. Uh, you know, celibacy, priestly celibacy is under attack, and I'm sure, sure Father covered a lot of it, but especially now that considering doing away with it in the Amazon, the Pope, and let's pray he doesn't, because they'll say it's a discipline, it's, it's not a dogma, but uh, the problem, and with all the sexual scandals, so they said this is the problem. So, no, celibacy is not the problem. It's homosexuality. Yeah. All right, and let's be very clear about that. And it's demonic. Our next question is for uh, you, Father Isaac, uh, in respect of your recommendation that we consecrate uh, our loved ones or even our enemies to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Uh, it's a two-part two question. Number one, is there a specific consecration prayer that you use or have? And should I consecrate my family by name or in general? Which is more effective? Well, number one, you should consecrate by name. You can. You know, I consecrate Tommy, Mary, whatever their name is. And there are beautiful formulas. Now, St. Louis de Montfort, he has a preparation of 30 days, and I think it's really good because you, first of all, you know, I'm just trying to break the ice here. You want to study. You, don't, you want to know what you're doing, but you want to know what you're getting into. So that when you do it, you know, your will is fully engaged, intact, and you, you have sufficient knowledge. You know what you're doing, and you want to do it. And that's, it's an act of the will. And so technically, all it takes is a short formal. You can say, uh, dear blessed mother, I consecrate myself to your immaculate heart. I give myself totally to you as your possession and property. Do me what you will in this world and the next. Some of that comes from St. Maximilian, of course. And that would be sufficient. Or just say, blessed mother, I consecrate myself totally to you. It's an act. But the formulas of St. Louis de Montfort and St. Maximilian Kolbe is what I really recommend. And it's beautiful. And it's good to even have those formulas and recite them every morning for yourself. Renew your consecration every day. Because our fiat is, is not just one time. It's every morning we wake up, we have to renew our consecration to God, you know, our, 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 our commitment. And it keeps you on your toes, you know. You don't, you don't want to forget that you belong to Our Lady. So I hope that answers it. The next question for you, Father Rodriguez. I understand that there is a big difference between the Latin Mass and, and the Vatican II Mass, but it's not because it, it is said in Latin, is it? Can't the traditional Mass be said in English and still maintain the integrity of the rite? It would draw in so many more people to appreciate it, it would seem to me. It's true that the language is not the primary, primary point. Um, and so, um, I guess in a theoretical uh, level, you could um, argue that, well, what about the, the traditional Latin mass that say remaining exactly the same in terms of all the um, ritual or all the different rites that, are, that, that make up the mass, um, prayers being exactly the same, but it would just be um, translated into English. Um, there are, though, a number of important reasons why I would strongly, strongly argue against it. Um, I guess maybe the first one is that uh, hopefully in time, I don't necessarily expect all of the faithful to appreciate this, but hopefully in time um, we'll realize that the language isn't that much of a barrier as a lot of times we think it is. If something is really important to us, we're going to make the effort to adapt. And I think it's also important in terms of the Mass and all its aspects that we understand. We have to conform to the Mass. I mean, the Mass has to change us. Uh, the Mass is meant to um, transform us not us trying to transform the mass according to our liking. That already in itself, I think, is problematic. Uh, not, and again, I'm not talking so much on the practical level. I mean, uh, that, yes, I can see how people might think, well, Father, if it were in English, then a lot of people would be, like, let's say, drawn to the Latin mass. And I'm thinking, well, yes, but I think we also need to have a greater level of maturity to realize that... Um, we have to conform ourselves to um, God and to the faith that he's given us and the truths that, he, that he's given us. Um, 
it's not that big of a barrier, the language, because sometimes I give the example and I tell people, look, if you're a businessman and, you know, you're going to a foreign country to do business, like, I don't know, say Japan or, you know, Germany, uh, wherever it might be, Norway, uh, and you're going often enough, well, there's a good chance that you're going to make an effort to start learning at least some words in that foreign language so that, you know, you can kind of make better deals, you know, you get ahead in your, in your business. Because there's motivation, you know, something is motivating one, and so one makes the effort to learn. And I think the same should be the case with, uh, with our faith and, and, you know, with, and with the Mass. Uh, you can follow, I mean, I would tell any Catholic, look, you can follow all the beautiful prayers of the Latin Mass uh, in your own language. You know, let's say, whether it's English, Spanish, or whatever it might be, with your missile. Um, I mean, I don't really, I don't really see the, the great need to, let's say, translate it into the vernacular in that respect. I mean, whoever wants to understand the words, you know, you have them there in your, you, you have them there in your missile. You also have the danger, though, that translations are never perfect, and you have to take this seriously. I mean, translations are never perfect. It's also true that just in terms of the language, and I think this is also why, providential, why providentially God has given us the Roman rite in the Latin language, is that there are very special aspects to the Latin language that, um, you know, even linguists admit that that suited almost ideally for, uh, you know, our, our worship in terms of how it's both succinct and has a, a kind of um, even, um, uh, I would say, I, 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 don't, I don't know all the technical terms, but like a certain rhythm, a certain cadence, a certain way of expressing the theological concepts that the other languages simply don't have. I don't know, maybe even, um, maybe even Dr. Childs, um, not that he could answer now, but, you know, if someone's really interested, I don't know, maybe he'd have some insight in there, but um, I would say almost analogously to how you have the Gregorian chant also in the Latin language, it is really something unique in terms of its, its, its beauty and, the, and for pr the praise of God, analogous to the Latin language also, even in terms of prayer. I mean, these are significant things. And I mean, you're talking about important things, and then you weigh that you weigh it against. Well, someone just thinking, well, it's going to be easier for me, you know, if if it's in English. I would say, look, make the effort to to learn the Latin if it's that important um, to you. I mean, other than let's say, I mean, obviously you can you know follow it in your in your in your in your missal. But like I say, you got to be careful with the translations. And then there is also something extremely beautiful and important about the fact that the Mass is universal and it's the same. You go anywhere in the world and the faith is the same, the language, I mean, where the, the, the exact words that are being used for that liturgy, for the praise of God, it's the same in the Latin. Even if you have as exact translations as you could, it's still going to give more of an aspect of a Babel, of, you know, the Tower of Babel, you know, all these different languages. Even though, again, certainly the prayers would be far better, obviously, than what we've got, you know, in, in UMass. But, I mean, that's something also to really um, consider that, that needs to be considered as well. I think the last point I would just make on that is that this is something that I, um, I'll, I'll mention it. I'll actually mention it, hopefully, a little bit in the sermon right now at Mass. But one of our problems with really understanding the Mass well is that unfortunately, because this ties also a little bit with the talk that my brother David gave yesterday with the emotionalism and feelings. One of our problems with, with, not, with failing to understand the Mass sufficiently well is that, again, as also fallen human beings, we are far too attached to the, what is tangible and what is visible and what is audible, and we are not making nearly the effort that we need to at Mass to participate at Mass in faith. And that means really exercising your faith and believing in all of the hidden and sublime mysteries that are there at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Um, and definitely I would argue that the lang Latin language and even the fact that maybe most people today aren't necessarily that familiar with it, I would say there's actually a tremendous grace there also because it's telling you in a very kind of tangible way that what is taking place at Mass is not of this world. 
you know, if you hear it in your own language, you tend to think, well, yeah, it's like of this world. I can understand. I can touch. I can kind of get a grasp on it. You can't get a grasp on all these mysteries of the mass with just your human reason, with just your way of thinking and, and thinking, oh, I understood it, so now I kind of uh, understood mass. A phrase that I like to use, and I'll mention it at mass, is I say, mass is not something that is primarily understood in quotations. It's something to be believed. When you're at mass, you have to go, I mean, you should come out of mass and be asking yourself, did I believe? Not did I understand? And I think the Latin also helps us to get a little bit of better sense of the fact that we have to go beyond the the uh, yeah the senses and, and what is sensible to the mysteries that are there hidden in the holy sacrifice of the mass. So I said quite a bit. I hope I didn't go too long. I'm sure maybe Father Isaac might want to add something. Yeah, uh, Paul the sixth before he so-called promulgated the new mass, the Novus Ordo. He said the church never allows novelties or innovation when it comes to the liturgy. Never. It's not allowed. But this new order, this Novus Ordo, is a novelty, is an innovation. If I promulgate it, many, many will lose their faith. You hear what I just said? Well, he did what he said he can't do. And it happened. He's no prophet. He knew that's the natural consequences. So there's in the, the axiom, you know, lex orendi, lex credendi. As you pray, so you believe. Your prayer will affect the way you believe. The new mass was put together by Protestants. They, the, the Second Vatican Council invited six, seven Protestant ministers to tell us what to do with the holy sacrifice of the mass. And the first thing is you get rid of sacrifice. And so the real problem, the deeper problem with the Novus Ordo Mass, even in Latin, is it's stripped of sacrifice. And there was a man, Michael Davies, God rest his soul, who was an historian. He was a great man. And he wrote many books on these things. And I never forget, I did it years ago. He says, take a new missile and then take an old missile. And he said, take a pencil because I'm going to have you make marks. And do this for yourself. And he says, start with the new mass. And when you read the whole thing, anytime you see anything, any statement, that would, you would be offended if you were a Protestant, make a mark. And then do it with the old mass. So I did that, and if you, if you don't use the first canon, because there's really nine canons in the new mass, imagine, nine can Our canon goes back 1,500 years in the Trinitine mass. How dare they do what they did. And so if you don't use the first canon, you're lucky you get one, maybe one mark, two marks. If, the third, if you use the second canon, you know what the priests call that? They call it the instant canon. The minute you start the canon, you're calling God down from heaven. And so, it's, 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 so I did that, and then when you do the old mass, all of a sudden, you got a, a marks, marks, marks. You can't even add them up because you know, it's, it's, it's clear. There is a sacrifice, the same sacrifice of Calvary going on. And the Protestants don't believe that. And that's the real problem with the new mass. The next question is uh, for either of you. Uh, and uh, two people put a very similar question. So please comment on the gift of speaking in tongues. Uh, and also, just to add to that, can you comment on the healings or miracles apparently done by non-Catholics like Pentecostals and even in many charismatic Catholic groups? Um, with regard to the gift of tongues, just very quickly, to properly understand the gift of tongues, it's very important there too, obviously, to base ourselves on the apostles, on obviously the, the great coming of the Holy Ghost on Pentecost Sunday, and also the example of those saints of the Catholic Church that in fact had the gift of tongues. Because what's happening is today in a lot of the Pentecostal circles and even within the charismatic movement in the Catholic Church, I mean, you have all these, um, again, novel interpretations of what the gift of tongues is. Clearly what you have in the case of the apostles is you have the apostles preaching in, on, uh, uh, at Pentecost, 
uh, they're preaching basically in their own tongue, yet you have people from all these different regions that, that speak other languages that understand them, that hear them in their own language. So that basically is what the gift of tongues is. That it isn't, it isn't that someone is kind of like babbling in undecipherable uh, uh, sounds or language. One is speaking, let's say, in, in one's language, yet a lot of other people, instead of hearing them in, I mean, they're hearing them in their own language. You know, you, everybody understand there? Okay. There you have the gift of tongues because you have examples of that also from the saints. I mean, one of them is St. Vincent Ferrer. You know, he, you know, obviously went in, in the, you know, roughly, let's say, mid-1300s to the early 1400s, and he would, you know, preach all over Europe, you know, converted so many Jews and Muslims um, in Spain. But um, remarkable, because he would be preaching, and this may be not necessarily the gift of tongues in terms of distance, but, you know, he'd be preaching, and people, there were so many people hearing him that, you know, from two, three miles away, they could hear him. Um, and then also in terms of different languages. I mean, they didn't understand, let's say, his native tongue. I presume it was probably in Spanish. And, um, but, they, but they were able to understand what he was, what he was saying. So there, that, that with regard to the gift of tongues. Maybe I'll let Father Isaac comment a little bit on, on the other one. Maybe I want to say something on the gift of tongues. With regard to the to healings and miracles, I guess the only, I mean, the couple of comments that I think I would make right now is I would say, look, um, Again, even our senses can sometimes deceive us. We have to put always more faith on God's word. Those of you that were at Mass yesterday evening, and you'll remember I was talking about faith and explaining a little bit about faith, and I was talking about how when it comes to faith, we have to be even more certain of the truths that our Savior Jesus Christ speaks that's more certain than anything. That's more certain than what I see with my eyes. If I see something with my eyes, if I hear something with my ears, if I hear, if, if people give me, multiple people give me testimony about something that they saw or they heard, I have a more, I have greater certainty in its truth if our Savior Jesus Christ has spoken it. Or let's say the teachings of the Catholic Church. And so... If, for example, you have people that you know do not profess, let's say, the real Catholic faith in the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, for example, Protestants, and yet you think you're seeing miracles or whatever healings or you think you experienced one yourself, I would say, look, I'm not, I can't necessarily explain everything, but I, I'm going to put more faith and more trust in what I know is true that, you know, these people that let's say profess to be Protestants or whatever that that, that they are heretical and that they're not um, uh, that they're in error in that respect, uh, as opposed to putting faith and trust that oh well you know a miracle took place here so you know it's got to be the Holy Ghost. Um, and the other comment I would just make is look I, I think a lot of times those supposed miracles are questionable. I mean you know. What guarantee do you have that there was really an ailment there? And what guarantee do you have that it was really healed? Maybe for a time it went away and came back. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of questions that I would still say, whether it's a genuine miracle or not, it's tough, it's tough to know. But again, there's certain things that I do know, truths of the faith. And those who don't hold the Catholic faith, well, I would certainly say that's not from God. And, and that has to be corrected. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, he states that God, would, in our times, basically, in his TV saying, would only give the gift of tongues to a missionary priest, his father said, go into foreign country, so when he preached, they would understand, because there is no salvation outside the church, and it's for the salvation of the souls. But all this other stuff, you have to be very careful with these. The charismatic renewal is basically Protestantism. And I warn all you people here, do not go to these prayer groups. Do not let these people lay hands on you. Because I have had to do many, many deliverance with people that they, we start coming to me. They, their whole life is turned into a, a total chaos. Bad things are happening to them. So I start, you have to question them when you start diagnosing the problem. And so many times it goes back to, oh, I can't believe it, Father. Yeah, I, I went to a charismatic prayer group. 
now that I think about it, it was after that, after those people laid hands on me, all my problems started. Be careful. Because you don't know who's laying hands on you. You don't know. They could be infiltrated a group too, Satanists. And as far as working miracles outside uh, uh, the church, St. Alphonse of Gori says it is blasphemous to say that God would work a miracle outside of his church unless it was to bring someone into the church. Why? Because if God's going to perform miracles to these Protestants, he's confirming them in their false religion where they can't save their soul. So think about it. It makes sense. And as far as the devil, the devil has powers, you know. He can't do miracles, but he could do prodigies. And you could say, look what happened with Moses when he, drew his, when he went to Pharaoh. He drew his scepter down, and uh, the magicians turned into the snake. But what happened? Moses' scepter turned, was a bigger snake, and he swallows that snake up. So we have to be very careful. And uh, like I said, if God's going to do a miracle, it's, he's not going to confirm someone in a f false religion so they could lose their soul. The next question is for either of you. Uh, the church does not make uh, praying the rosary a precept of the church. As long as I stay out of mortal sin, can I get to heaven if I don't pray the rosary? I would just quickly, uh, maybe Father Isaac can comment more on it. I would just say, no, it's true that it's not made a precept of the church, but definitely do uh, take very seriously, again, our Blessed Mother at Fatima, specific for our times, at every single apparition uh, in Fatima, she asks that we pray the rosary every day. And um, hopefully, as a faithful Catholic, an important question that you'll make to yourself as far as trying to know what you should do and what you shouldn't do is also, how can I please my mother? Like Father Isaac, I think, was also saying in his talk, how can I grow in my devotion? I mean, be devoted to our Blessed Mother, love our Blessed Mother. Um, so extremely important there. And if you're following that rule of thumb, how can I grow in my love for the Blessed Virgin Mary? How can I be more devoted to her? And obviously also to her son, by extension. I mean, if you're devoted to our Blessed Mother, you're devoted to her son. Um, a, a beautiful and very important way is obviously through praying the rosary. The, just, the other quick comment I would make is what is a precept of the church and really a basic commandment of God is you have to pray, and you're not going to be saved without prayer. That for sure. So I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how the question was, but something about can I get to heaven, maybe or something like that. You cannot get to heaven if you don't pray. So you absolutely have to pray, and I think that's really important to take seriously because I think all of us know, I think we've all experienced that, that a lot of times it's difficult to pray faithfully, a lot of times we fall short in our prayer. You know, we get tired at night. We don't pray as well as we should. Other things come up and we miss prayers here. We miss prayers there. And a beautiful thing about the rosary is that if you make the firm commitment to pray the rosary every day and you're doing your best to be faithful to that rosary and to pray it as well as you can, that you're, you know, you're automatically, by virtue of that rosary, I mean, fulfilling that all-important principle that you have to pray, even Paul says, pray without ceasing, that you have to pray and, and you know, you get, in other words, you're, you're praying every day. And that is absolutely necessary for salvation. And so it's a big help for us weak sinners who a lot of times fall short to have that kind of almost rock or anchor of knowing, you know, I am being faithful to prayer, which is essential for our salvation. You know, so many people, I'm sure we would like a direct line to God, right? We could say, you know, hello, what do you want from me, Lord? And what well, we have a direct line to God is the Blessed Virgin Mary. And when she came to Fatima and many other times, she tells us, the mother of God is telling us, pray to Rosary. So if you don't want to listen to her, you're stupid. <laughs> You're a fool, all right? And you know what? <laughs> I can't put it any better than that. And, and uh, the bottom line is this. Once again, I told people yesterday, you know, the image of the good shepherd. Our Lord calls he's a good shepherd with sheep. It's not a compliment. Sheep are stupid. They're very stupid. We're stupid people. We need help. 
And so this prayer is angelic. It's a prayer that came from the angelic salutation from heaven. It's just like the Our Father. It's from our Lord. That's the, that's the greatest prayer. Teach us how to pray. And so, no, you don't have to do that. But, you know, I tell people, do you play fast and loose with your, with your bank account? Oh, no, Father. <laughs> oh, no. You know, I'm not. So why play fast and loose with your soul? And so you don't have to do it. God doesn't force you. But he sent his mother to tell us this. It's the, when you study, like I said, the Abel Jensen heresy was conquered by the rosary. And so I tell people, and I'm going to be very clear, it's not an option for me. And I tell people, no, it's not an option. So just shut up and do it. <laughs> All right? It's not an option. You know, when we, as priests, I'm sure Father, was, we wonder sometimes, do people actually listen to us, you know? <laughs> and uh, so one day I was, I was preaching in, in Kansas years ago, and uh, this late, it was the Feast of the Holy Rosary. And I gave a whole big sermon on the rosary, and I was yelling at them, it's not an option. If you want to say, and so this lady calls me up uh, a week later, and I didn't even know who she was. She goes, Father, you remember your sermon Sunday on the rosary? I said, yes. She goes, the next day I was walking in, in Walmart with my little Johnny. He's, he's three years old, three years old. And all of a sudden, the minute we walked in Walmart, he started yelling out the top of his lungs, the rosary is not an option. The rosary is not an option. And she goes, at first she was embarrassed. Then she said, let him go. She, so that little kid got it. If that three-year-old boy can get it, so can you. And the next question is for either of you. Uh, traditional Catholic people are often accused of being Pharisees who rejected Jesus' teachings of God's love and, mer and mercy. How do you respond to that? Uh, just a quick answer on that one. I guess Father Isaac can add more if you'd like. Um, I would just simply say that there certainly may be truth to that. Uh, but insofar as it's true, I would say, well, we have to make uh, more of an effort, I think, to also be patient and charitable with those who don't, let's say, respond to the need to recover the Mass and recover, you know, our, our traditional Catholic faith, you know, authentic doctrine. That those that don't respond as, as quickly as we think they should to just continue to be uh, patient and uh, charitable towards them, but at the same time, be firm and continue to encourage, it, encourage them and, you know, learn your faith well enough so that you can make at least, you know, credible arguments to them to try to, you know, convince them and help them to see the vast difference between what's going on right now in the mainstream church and how we need to recover our Catholic faith. But I do think that it's extremely important that um, as Catholics, again, whether traditional or not, but I mean, if you want to use the label traditional, but as Catholics, I think it's extremely important, obviously, that we practice charity. We have to. I mean, th that's central to our, our um, faith. I mean, that's... Uh, uh, if, we, if we want to grow in holiness and in perfection, I mean, we have to love Jesus, first and foremost, above all, and, and obviously also our neighbor. And... So I do think that in, in, in many circles, it's a legitimate criticism. So, I mean, but simply I would say, well, we have to do better. Um, uh, but again, even if you have someone, let, let's say you had a traditional Catholic that was treating you, let's say, uncharitably, it still doesn't take away from the fact of what's true or what's not. I mean, if somebody were to come and tell me, for example, I don't know, in an uncharitable way, tell me that I was, again, maybe... Uh, to use here Father Isaac's words, if somebody were to come and tell me, hey, Father, you're stupid because you don't, you don't offer the traditional Latin Mass, and, you, and it's not an option, you have to offer the Latin Mass, well, I might feel really bad, and I might say, well, you know, this person really treated me uncharitably, but I also need to reflect and ask myself, well, okay, but is that true or not? And so, I mean, you know, that, that's part of the equation there, but again, the quick answer is, do your best to practice charity. That's important. And I do think we need that because sadly, I mean, I could go on a long time on this topic, but I think 
a big problem that we have is among traditional Catholics, we continue to have a lot of infighting. You know, you have different groups and you got one group condemning the other and they're saying, don't go to mass with such and such, don't go to mass with these, don't go to mass here, don't go to mass there. And I definitely urge all of you, look, please stay out of that. I mean, you may have your convictions and, and preferences on where you're gonna go to the Latin mass, that's fine. And you don't have to agree with everybody else uh, that's going to, let's say, another traditional Latin Mass. But don't be condemning each other and don't be fighting about those things. I mean, we got way bigger problems right now going on in just a total apostasy that's, that's going on in the church. And so many souls out there that need to be saved that don't even know anything about the Latin Mass, for example, or about authentic Catholic doctrine, that we need to put our energies in helping them and not fighting, fighting amongst those that are already going to the Latin Mass. Uh, the next question is for either of you. My mother and father are Catholic. They are 85 and 84 years old. My mother is a devout Novus Ordo Catholic, and my father is a very bitter, fallen away Catholic for most of his life. Can I or should I at an opportune time suggest and, and help prepare them for a visit when needed with a traditional priest uh, for, extre uh, for extreme unction? Or what other advice might you give me? Well, there's no profit at home, that's for sure. So usually this is a difficult when you're dealing with family, the most difficult, because our Lord said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword to put mother against daughter, father against son. The main thing that's going to bring these people like this to God or, you know, open them up when they need to get it is, is you got to do prayer and penance for people, especially your loved ones. That's your first, you're obliged to. So, but... You know, once again, it's how you do it, you know, and and I tell people, pray, and I've helped many people. They said, no, my mother won't see you, and, and they, they're shocked, and I said, no, you pray, you send your angel to your mother, send your angel to your father, and your holy God angel, it, it really works. It's amazing. When I have a meeting with someone, especially people I don't get along with or something, I say, holy God and angel, you know, go to them and prepare that God's will be done, that this meeting will glorify God. And you, you'd be amazed how much smoother these things go. So I would say, yeah, because so many people, and I'll tell you a quick story, and this is a real true story. I, I did missions all over the country, so I was in Kansas, and I did a mission, and the priest invited me back, and he wanted me to go to dinner at someone's house. I really wasn't up to, he goes, no, you gotta go, you gotta go, so I went. And she said, can I tell you a story, Father, before we eat, sure. Well, I was Baptist, and I came into the church, not. I don't know how many years ago. And when you came, you preached about no salvation. And it just hit me to the core. And I was petrified for my mother. She's been sick for a long time that she was going to lose her soul and go to hell. And so I begged Our Lady. I begged. I prayed rosary after rosary for our conversion. And there her mother is dying in the hospital now, she says. And she tried numerous times. Ma, would you like to talk to a Catholic priest, no, no, no. So she's praying, and she said she's crying. Bless the mother, my mother's going to die. Please, I know you're my mother. Hear my prayer. And so she's really bad. The doctor's telling her it's going to be soon. And so she said to her husband, do me a favor. Take my father out for coffee. I'm going to try one more time. So she said to the mother, Ma, would you like me to get uh, Father Peter, the Catholic priest? She says, I can't believe you said that. I was just going to tell you, can you get the priest? So she came, the priest came, he's a friend of mine, and he, the old right, he did everything, conditionally baptized her, confirmed her, confessed her, he did everything. Gave her last rites, holy viaticum, her first communion was her last communion. And then, right after Father Peter left, the father came back, he didn't even know what happened. And so they're in the room, and she's, she's ready to die. And they're at her bed, and this is a true story. And she said she saw this, all of a sudden, this, she, she screamed out, Mommy went to heaven, you know? And she said, when she said that, she saw this gigantic angel appear, where she actually seen an angel. And you could doubt this, but I don't. And the angel put her hand, his hands into her mother's body and carried, lifted the soul up. And that's when she died. So it gets better. So she was in shock. She grabbed her husband and the other. She said, I got to tell you what happened. He says, you better be quiet. They'll think you're nuts. Don't tell nobody that story. 
And so they go home hours later, and they took the father home, and, you know, and everybody's sitting around. And the father says, listen, I got to talk to you guys because something happened, and uh, I just have to tell you. Remember when you yelled out, Mommy went to heaven? At that moment, I saw this big angel, and she describes it in more detail, exactly the same way she described it. Put his hands into my wife's body, and I saw him take her soul up to heaven. So I'm just telling you, encourage, never give up on the soul. Never give up, especially on your mother and father. You wear your knees out. Do it with charity, and just, it will happen. Just real quickly, I would comment, I think because of the way the question was phrased, I would definitely say yes, do try to get the traditional priests to go, um, you know, visit your parents. But also, I would say, kind of the general rule is this, I mean, I don't, I would strongly encourage all of you, don't be waiting. I mean, I'd say, start right now to do the very best that you can to recover the Catholic faith. So to uh, be faithful to the traditional Latin Mass, to really start um, learning more, you know, the traditional catechism. I mean, work hard so you can see more clearly uh, how, on the one hand, we have what is authentically our Catholic religion, and then now we have all these novelties that in so many ways is a Protestantization and secularization of our Catholic religion. You know, work hard. I mean, dedicate yourself 100% as best as you can to start going in the right direction as a, as, a, as a faithful Catholic. And then, like right now, do what you can to help others. So, like, if it's your parents, try to help them. I mean, now, again, because of their age, I don't know, maybe they're homebound, uh, who knows. But, I mean, depending on what each person is capable of doing, I mean, don't wait. Right now, start trying to encourage them to also do the same. So, for example, if you could like invite your mother or, or take your, I mean, or take them, even I think it was she's a devout Novus Ordo Catholic. Well, invite her if you could, if if, she, if you're able to take her to mass to the traditional Latin mass. I'd say, well, start doing that now. I mean, don't wait till well, she, you know, she's now really, really ill or whatever it might be. Hopefully, everybody understands the main point. Get moving in that direction right now and do the best you can to help others as, as best as you can. Just. And I'll say one more thing, like, if you have time, you're like, there's, you know, you're running out, but if they're well, you invite the priest over for dinner with your parents or something and let the priest, you, you know, the average priest is going to use his head. He's not going to go over there, you know, and bully them and let them, you know, I've done this before too. And you sit down with people, you have a regular meal, you just meet these people where they're at, the priest, you start talking, all of a sudden they say, you know, hey, that priest ain't too bad. I don't, you know, he's, he's a regular guy. You know, bring him around again. You know, things happen. Father Isaac, please give us some guide, guidance on how we should relate socially with homosexual couples at work or in volunteer organizations. Do we try to avoid them? Do we try to be friendly with them or not, but not too friendly? Or do we try to preach to them in this social situation? Uh, she let <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's, uh, I'm probably not the one to answer this. <laughs> it, it's a, I'll be honest, I'm going to make a confession. It, it's very hard for me to deal with those people. But I have to, if I have to, but the very few of them come from help. And, and, and so, but for me, it's very difficult. You know, uh, it's repulsive. It's disgusting. Uh, but they have a soul, and God died for that soul. And so I have to do everything I could if someone comes in good faith, now if they come and they're flaunting their nonsense in front of me, I say, get out of here before I crack you in the head. You know, if they start kissing each other, and I've seen that happen. I've been on a plane, they did it in front of me because they knew I was a priest, and I got stuck behind these two clowns for the whole trip. And so I started doing deliverance prayers. You should have seen them squirming in their pants, <laughs> you know. And those demons on them, because there's demons on these people, we knocked it off. But like I said, uh, you know, charity goes far, my friends, and so all I could say is, but I don't, you don't invite them over to your house for dinner, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or one person maybe, but none of this uh, knowledge in them that they're a couple, no, you can't. You don't want to confirm anyone in their sins, and so 
sometimes one on one, uh, if you could, you know, you, you, they, they have a soul. Christ died for their souls. Try to be charitable. And if you could reach out you know, in any way possible, but never compromise on the truth. And true charity has to, you know, eventually say you, you're going to lose your soul if you continue. They know it. They know it. I don't know if you want to add for all this. <laughs> Father Rodriguez, uh, uh, in, in respect of your um, talk on the Blessed Sacrament, is it okay to visit our Lord in the tabernacle of a Novus Ordo church? Uh, it's a good question. Um, obviously, I would recommend to try as best as you can to make your visits to the Blessed Sacrament at the, let's say, the, the traditional chapels or like the, the traditional parishes. So I would definitely say do make an effort to try to do that. I mean, I would say try to make that um, really the priority. Uh, if you're unable, or again, I know that in a lot of cases those are more, more distance. I mean, it's further. And, and in terms of making a visit, obviously, you've got the Novo Soto parishes that are closer by. Um, I would say in terms of making the visit to the Blessed Sacrament, yes, it's okay. I mean, I, I think it can, it, especially also if you think that maybe, you know, it really helps you, I mean, to be able to have that time before our Lord President of the Blessed Sacrament. Um, but I would recommend that you try to at least find the, the Novus Ordo Parish where at least the most reverence is shown to our Lord. Um, and I would not recommend that you go like let's say if they're doing exposition of the Blessed Sacrament or other things, I mean, I'm, I'm talking more, I would, only, I would only say, well, okay, if, if it's just the Blessed Sacrament there and you're kind of alone, maybe, maybe some other people, but I'd say, well, okay, I mean, it, it, I, I think maybe it could help you. But um, if they're doing other things, I mean, like again, exposition, things like this, I would recommend not to go because again, there you start getting all these different kinds of abuses that, you know, unfortunately, shouldn't be taking place. And it goes back to also what I was mentioning in that talk about uh, are we also treating our Lord present in the Blessed Sacrament in a, in a worthy way? And I mean with a proper love, reverence, and respect. So that's why I could see, I could see an argument being made, well, Father, you know, I'm, it, I, I'm alone, I'm going, I'm making a visit, I, I'm doing my best to really, you know, love, honor, and show reverence to our Lord. So, but again, like I say, I do think that still, if you're making the extra sacrifice to also go to, let's say, the traditional chapel to make your, your visit to our Lord in the tabernacle, um, I think the extra sacrifice also, you know, is very valuable. I mean, uh, valuable in terms of also showing your love for our Lord and, and also uh, in terms of, you know, helping, contributing to helping the church get out of the, uh, this terrible crisis that she's in. Uh, two qu uh, quick related questions. Can you go to confession if you are not baptized? And uh, do you have to be baptized to go for communion, for instance, if you are about to die? Uh, easy answer to both of them. Uh, no, if you're not uh, baptized, you can't go to confession. And I think the other one was if you're not baptized, communion? No. Yeah. No, if you're not baptized, you can't go. You can't receive Holy Communion. Now, neither of you are priests of the Society of St. Pius X, but we have a question. What is your take, if any, on the Society of St. Pius X's rapprochement with Rome? Um, again, I guess I'll be a little careful with my comments just because of what I also told all of you earlier. I don't think... I think we want to do the best we can to be supportive of each other in terms of traditional Catholics and, um, you know, not be, you know, fighting one against another. Um, I think there's obviously a lot of good that the Society of St. Pius X is doing. I mean, um, obviously, they're on the good side. And I think we always need to, um, you know, do our best to support their work, um, work together with them as best as we can. I mean, I mean, really, really see each other as um, um, allies. Um, in terms of this whole thing about rapprochement with Rome, look, it's 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 a really difficult issue because I mean, a lot of a lot of it is a question of prudence. I mean, how. I mean, the Society of St. Pius X, I mean, is dealing also with a difficult issue in that they're saying, on the one hand, we have to be firm 
and hold on to the Catholic faith and hold on to the, to the, to the Catholic uh, mass and we can't compromise on, let's say, worship and doctrine and they're, and they're certainly correct in that. And then on the other hand, they're saying, but we know that there is still a problem because we're in a canonically irregular situation and we want to get that resolved. I mean, we want to do our best to also be faithful Catholics. We know that we have to be uh, under, you know, church authority. And so how, how, to, how do we deal with that? So, I mean, I think it's really important to recognize that this is difficult. I mean, it's a really difficult situation. And so you can have people legitimately disagreeing on what, the, the correct path to take is, but we shouldn't raise it to this level, like kind of like saying you're a traitor or you're this or you're that because you're not doing it the way I think is best. Now, I'll give you my personal opinion, but again, it's just my personal opinion. Father Isaac's may be different. Father so-and-so might also be different. I mean, personally, I, I am concerned. I, I don't, I think that uh, from my view, I think there's been um, a, a bit too much of an effort to kind of try and get things squared away with Rome in the last few years. And alongside that, I don't think the Society of St. Pius X has done enough to really stand up and fight for the faith like they, you know, traditionally have done, especially in these times where things are getting worse and worse. I mean, things are getting worse and worse and worse under the pontificate of Pope Francis. And I would say now is when even more we need to stand up and defend the faith and when necessary, call out the wolves for, for who they are. So, um, and, and I personally don't think that under Francis's pontificate is the time to get that canonical regularization. I, mean, I would say, look, you got to oppose, you know, the, the, all the evil that Pope Francis is doing and, 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 and resist and fight against it as best as you can and trust in the grace of God that hopefully at some time in the near future then this regularization will take place. But again, I'm strictly saying just my personal opinion. Please don't misinterpret it. I, I'm not, you know, I um, um, am very, I have great, admiration and um, gratitude, support for, you know, in general, the work that the SSPX is doing, um, you know, and, you know, I would encourage all the faithful, I would say, look, if, if you're, you know, going to an SSPX chapel, you know, you know, continue to do your best to live your Catholic faith, you know, all those things, so. Hopefully. Uh, Father Isaac, a question came in uh, during the wise decision, Father, to not get into the hornet's nest here. So I, I, I <laughs> no, but don't worry, don't worry. That's fair. I didn't, no, no, that's fair. I didn't answer. I didn't answer all the homosexual issues. So. Someone is goading you on, Father. <laughs> well, I, no, I could comment. I mean, I agree with a lot. It Father works. Says. Number one, uh, thank God for Archbishop Lefebvre. That's all I could say because we wouldn't, we would not have the mass without him. And I do believe he was a saint, and I do believe that after the great chastisements and the reign of peace, he will be canonized. I, now, part two is I, I pray that they remain faithful to his, to his true spirit. And, and be careful, too, because there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of calumny that goes around. Those are lies that they were saying. They cut a deal. They did this, and then nothing happened. So don't believe everything you read on the Internet, my friends, too. So be careful because you get the wrong information. You don't want to be a vehicle of that uh, calumniate in the society or anyone else. So the, the last thing I know that came from Rome is because the sacred congregation for the doctrine of faith is handless now. And they, they said, it, it's coming down to uh, doctrine. And I said, praise God, they finally said something true. And they, guess who's on the right side of the doctrine? It's the society. It's not Rome, unfortunately. So it's a mess. And like I said, I, I do hope that they do, you know, maybe become a little more vocal, especially with Chris Francis. There's more confusing of now than there's ever been. And there's people... More and more people, because God brings good out of evil. And more and more people, when God allows heresies and this nonsense coming out of Rome, a lot more people, they say Pope Francis has been the greatest, uh, the greatest boost to the traditional movement. <laughs> he really has. He's brought more people to the tradition than Father Rodriguez and myself can do in 10 lifetimes. <laughs> you know? 
So uh, let's just pray that they remain faithful, that they don't fudge on anything. I mean, but we got a lot to be thankful for them, uh, what they've done, because they have, you know, been steadfast to this point. Okay? And so let's pray, because if, God forbid, they do give in and it's not, it won't be good for the whole church then. All right? We have uh, just one minute left. Father Isaac, someone uh, sent in a question during this question and answer session. Just to clarify, when you say a perfect act of love, is that the same as a perfect act of contrition? Yeah, basically, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. Uh, what, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Father Isaac, Father uh, Rod uh, Rodriguez. Um, and that concludes our uh, last formal session at the Fatima Center Seattle Conference. I just have a, a couple of uh, closing remarks, and one of them, I want to address one question that came in, and I'll take it uh, myself. Uh, there was a question, I know there are many F Fatima apostolates, why is Father Paul Kramer and the servants of Jesus and Mary now separated from the Fatima Center? And I just wanted to clarify that, because uh, we've, we've gotten several questions over the weekend about that. Uh, so just very, very briefly, and I'm happy to talk to people afterwards if you want more details, but uh, essentially, uh, Father Gruner, uh, when he died, uh, there were two companies. There was an American company called Servants of Jesus and Mary and the Canadian company called National Pilgrim Virgin, and they both worked together. Uh, they were together. They uh, both worked uh, to f in the furtherance of Father Gruner's uh, message. Uh, but they had different boards of directors, and when Father died, those boards of directors uh, then became responsible for the running of the, the uh, apostolate that Father Gruner had created. Uh, and the American board of directors uh, uh, of the Servants of Jesus and Mary wanted to take a very different path uh, to the Canadian board of directors. National Pilgrim Virgin in Canada was uh, and still remains the place where Father Gruner, uh, well, it was the place where Father Gruner worked in Canada in Fort Erie, uh, and all of the, for lack of a better word, the brain work of the operation was done, uh, all the, the publications, the creation of the programs, and everything was done out of, out of Canada. So the, um, the American Board of Directors wanted uh, the apostolate to go in a very different direction, uh, and uh, Father Paul Kramer being one of uh, the, the people um, who was working with the American company, uh, he wanted us to sort of proclaim that uh, Pope Francis is not the Pope, uh, that he has lost the office, and, and, uh, and we thought uh, it, that it was uh, more prudent that, that good, good Catholics can have, can, you know, Catholics uh, who are in good, uh, good faith can, can reasonably disagree about that issue. And we saw, uh, much more importantly, our mission to stand for the Fatima message, regardless of what your position is on who is the Pope. Uh, Father Isaac gave a, a talk about, you know, what Catholics are to do, and I think he, he set out the position of the apostolate on that um, very uh, ably in his talk. So, as a result, there was a split. Uh, between Servants of Jesus and Mary and National Pilgrim Virgin. Servants of Jesus and Mary have continued on their own. Uh, the, uh, the MPV set up a new American corporation called Fatima Center USA, uh, and we continue to work now with Fatima Center USA and MPV uh, to take the message uh, that uh, Father Gruner had forward. Uh, National Pilgrim, um, sorry, Servants of Jesus and Mary uh, is doing their own thing. So that's, I just wanted to clarify uh, that question because uh, someone submitted it and we've also heard it uh, from several other people this weekend. Uh, we will proceed shortly with the blessing of holy objects and uh, by Father Isaac uh, and, um, and the in, uh, scapular enrollment as well as rosary and mass uh, that Father Rodriguez will do. But just some final comments. Thank you very much, first of all, for coming to this conference.